when it comes to ventilation, pretty much, why don't we have a good understanding of ventilation? And I think it becomes very obvious if you look, if you look at the tools that we have to train firefighters. So what we wind up doing is we get really good at the how, because that's what we can easily do in training. We can cut holes in roofs, we can force doors, we can break windows, we can do all the hows. You can't really easily simulate every other question, because what we have to work with, for the most part, is concrete training buildings and metal containers. So when you have this to work with, what did we learn this morning, right? You put some pallets in the corner of a concrete training building, you make a fuel-limited fire. When you have a fuel-limited fire, no matter where you vent, when you vent, or how much you vent, things get better. So we're showing our recruits in training that when I opened this up, things got better. Because we can't replicate reality, because we can't put realistic fuel loads in there, because we've proven that we can kill firefighters in training. And maybe we don't understand fire dynamics well enough to do that safely. So we get, we have competing issues, right? We want to be able to show realistic conditions. However, we don't have the tools to do it. So we need something to kind of bridge the gap. And if you are using concrete training buildings, that's not to say that you can't teach good, effective, coordinated attack or ventilation tactics in these buildings. You can, it just takes good instructors to support it to make it work. So if you go ahead and you've got an instructor following the truck <coughs> around, and they're being kicked in the butt, ventilate, 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 and they're not paying attention to where the hose line is, they're not paying attention to where they ventilate in coordination with the engine crew, the exercise needs to be interrupted and the proper teaching points need to be made because the fire is not going to respond in a negative way. You're not going to drive it to flash it over on the truck crew searching ahead of the engine crew because you're burning three pallets in the corner of a concrete training building. Not to say that you would want to do that anyway, but how do you learn if all you see is everywhere I threw a metal shutter open, had a positive impact. My visibility got better, the heat lifted. When I opened two windows, the heat lifted even more. Because we're, we have a fuel limited fire. So we need, to, we need to be teaching better. So we ran a number of experiments to, to look at this exact issue. Here's an example of one of them. 1,200 square foot ranch house. We're going to look at the impact of opening the front door and a window near the seat of the fire. The purpose is, is to show you, during these experiments, we're looking at things that you can't normally look at. We've got views in every room. We've got sensors in every room. We've got the temperatures every foot in every room. We've got gas concentrations. We've got heat fluxes. We've got all kinds of measurements taking place in here where we can evaluate the tactics, in this case, open the front door and bending near the seat of the fire. And one of the things that I want you to see is the bedrooms remote from the seat of the fire are black. The fire sucks the oxygen out of those rooms. There's no air back there to burn. So even though there might be plenty of fuel to burn, if there's no air to burn back there, it's not going to burn. It will burn where the oxygen is provided, which is going to be by the front door and by the front window. Another thing you need to notice is the bedrooms don't automatically have a giant lift of smoke when the front gets open. Because the flow path is between the front of the house and the fire, not into the back of the house. You would have to bend the back of the house to get a tunnel or a small lift in the back that would ultimately spread the fire into the back bedroom. So we'll talk about a lot of that. Stages of fire development. Dan hit on this this morning. We have to consider air into our stages of fire growth. And ultimately, this is pretty simple. We're going from ignition to growth. The fire runs out of air, starts to decay, our initial decay period. An opening gets made. Let's say the front door gets open. The fire responds to that oxygen, and the fire takes off. All right, let's step it up a notch. Two things are happening. The front door is getting open, and a hole is getting put in the roof. That's what that looks like. The fire grows. It goes in additional decay. 
front door gets open, provides air to see the fire, fire increases in size. But again, it hits a limit, right? It's only getting air through the front door. It wants to burn more than the air it's getting through the front door. It's when it's limited, it's fully developed. But then you got that up in the roof. So now what are we doing? Well, we're allowing more air to come in through the front door, so our fully developed energy is actually higher. So now we've got fire coming out of the roof and fire coming out of the front door, and that fire still has more fuel. You make another opening, it's going to step up again until you interrupt it with water. And that's what's happening at the back end here. Hose line goes on the fire, we go into the K stage. So that's just two actions on the fire ground or what the fire growth stages look like for opening the front door, opening the roof, and putting water on the fire. Had an incident in Prince George's County. Um, won't go into too much detail on this, short of saying, small house, little to nothing showing, very small fuel load in the house, an issue with the hose line causing a delay. So what you're looking at is an engine company, a truck company showing up in very short order. Almost the exact thing that you would want, right? I got an engine crew, I got a truck crew coordinating. This can go well. Hose line had some issues. Truck crew got in ahead of the hose line. Wasn't communicated to the truck crew. The truck crew was forced to bail out. And you can see that the timeline of the first picture to the last picture was two minutes. What were we talking about earlier when we showed the experimental results as to what your coordination window was? From nothing, just about nothing showing, to fully involved front of the house, two minutes or less. Forcing the front door is ventilation. How many of you teach fire behavior with your forcible entry class? Probably not many, right? They're different subjects, so we tend to not put them together. Probably the best ventilation point you can make for any fire is a door. It goes all the way to the ground, allows for more air to entrain in, allows for some hot gases to go out the top. Quickest way to grow a fire is with a front door, or with any door for that matter. This just shows that Simply opening the front door, whether it was the one-story house or the two-story house, didn't immediately make things better. Things got a heck of a lot worse. So that leads us to start talking about door control. If we can limit the air that's making it to the fire until we get water on it, then we're doing positive things. We're not allowing that fire to grow. Here's a short video that uh, shows that not controlling that door until you have water ready to go will result in a bad outcome. The fire is not waiting for you. And there she goes. How many times do we see chief officers show up on the scene, get the front door open, or the occupants leave the front door open? And we assume that, when they saved us the issue of forcing that front door. It's wide open already. We do our 360. And while we're doing that 360, that door's wide open, feeding air to that ventilation-limited fire, allowing it to increase in size. If you can limit that air, I'm not saying don't force the door and check for any occupants that might be inside the front door, but until you're ready to actually go and commence your attack on the fire, you need to limit that air. So we looked at the concept of door control. So we did two experiments side by side where the first one door all the way open, what we would normally do. Chock it open, it's all the way open, line goes through the front door. Second one, we opened it all the way to allow the crew to go in, and we simulated having a guy at the door hold the door closed as he's advancing line that closes the door about two-thirds of the way. So that line can run straight in. And again, there's all different variations of this and how you do it and everything else, and Derek's going to hit on some of that in a little bit. However, Simple action of, say, closing that door halfway to limit the air can have huge impacts on how that fire grows and spreads. So here's the side-by-side. -side. The one on the left was all the way open for 10 seconds, crew in, control the door. Second one, door completely open. What we're looking for is how long does it take for the temperatures at three feet in the living room to hit 400 degrees? That's our uh, comparison point in which case we go ahead and we open a vent in the roof. You can 
see a pretty big difference between the two. If the fire doesn't have the air, it can't grow. Here's what it looks like. In the one-story house, it bought about three minutes before it hit that 400-degree mark. So if you want to talk about giving your crew more time to find the seat of the fire, and you're controlling the air, you're buying them more time of while they're operating in the flow path. Because that's what's happening. The low pressure's behind you. The moment you go through that front door, you are between where that fire is and where that fire wants to go. So if you control the air behind you, you're lessening the chance that that fire's coming over top of you. In the two-story house, because the fire was actually further from the front door, when we opened the front door, we were able to get that 400 degrees pretty quickly. When we controlled the front door, the fire almost put itself out. We had to open it all up to get the fire to come back. Because what happened was that air, the fresh air, wasn't making it all the way back to the fire. It was mixing with the smoke along the way, and 21% oxygen wasn't making it to where the fire was. So it took a lot longer for that fire to respond to the oxygen. And again, it's a temporary action. You want to limit the air until you gain the upper hand. And the upper hand is you begin to put water on the fire. The moment you begin to put water on the fire, open it all up. That's when your ventilation is starting to work for you. You're letting more out than the fresh air is allowing the fire to create. And it's, uh, I mean, it's not only for hose line advancement. If you, I'm not advocating searching ahead of the hose line, but if there's a scenario where you need to do it, you can limit your exposure to being in the flow path by closing the door behind you. If you're worried about the door latching on you or you can't secure it and keep it from closing all the way, drop a tool in it or pick a different tactic. It's a tool in the toolbox. Rate of change, this one was significant, and we saw this repeatedly. From when you open the front door and begin your ventilation operation, whether it's front door and windows, or front door and multiple windows, whatever it is, the reaction to oxygen is not instantaneous. There's a little bit of a delay. So in that little bit of a delay, I call it kind of the invitation period. Come on in, things aren't that bad. You get a little tunnel of fresh air being pulled in, all right, this is the one I'm going ahead of the hose line. Well, when things started to go bad and got really bad, like 200 degrees to 2,000 degrees, was happening on the order of 10 to 15 seconds. So how quick can you run? That's what winds up happening. If you're not controlling the environment you're in with water or controlling the air, things can go bad in a hurry. This is why we see the YouTube videos of the firefighters on fire, because they were in the inlet. They were feeling pretty cool until that oxygen got mixed in there and everything lit up around them, and then it was bad quickly. So there aren't a boatload of warning signs. Venting near versus venting far. Here's another one. We always teach you vent near the seat of the fire. Why is that? Well, because it lets the bad stuff out quicker, right? The caveat that they forget to leave out and then we commonly don't address in our training Venting near the seat of the fire is good if you're putting water on the fire. If you're not putting water on the fire, venting near the seat of the fire is the best way to make the fire the biggest, the fastest. Because you're giving it the oxygen right where it wants it. So if you want to go ahead and take a fire that is ready to go to flash over and really make it flash quickly, give it air right near it. Or if you want to spread the fire to the other part of the building, Go ahead and vent far. It's going to take longer for it to happen because you're going to have hot gases that are going to roll the ceiling. Go to the low pressure that you created, right? Fire's a pump. It's creating a high pressure. Anywhere you create a low pressure to the outside, that's where those hot gases are going to go. So the hot gases are going to travel out the vent. As soon as the temperatures get hot enough in the room that they're leaving to ignite something in that room, that room will quickly go to flashover and then you successfully move the fire from one room to the other room. If you're putting water on the fire, venting near the fire is the best thing because you're taking the hot stuff, the high pressure stuff, moving it to a low pressure and getting it out of the house as quickly as possible, which makes your job easier. Reading smoke. 
Here's another one that maybe is not so obvious, right? So we get a fire inside a structure that's creating a high pressure, so it's pushing smoke out of every crack it can possibly push smoke out of to a point. And that point is when the fire runs out of air and begins to decay and the temperatures go down, the pressures in the structure actually go negative. So it might be 500 degrees inside that house. It's going to have a negative pressure because it's trying to suck oxygen from anywhere it possibly can. In the grand scheme of things, these are things that we would interpret as backdraft conditions, where you see some smoke pulsing in and out, and then all of a sudden, you've got nothing showing whatsoever. So the message here is, if you get on the scene and you've got nothing showing, don't get complacent. If you've got smoke in the area, you may have a fire that was in the growth stage, ran out of oxygen, went into the decay stage, and it's waiting to get opened up. And the moment it gets opened up, it's going to get the oxygen at once. And because of the timelines we're dealing with here, you're not going to get a backdraft. You're not going to get an explosion unless it's been burning for a really, really long time. But air's going to go in, fire's going to grow, it's going to go to flashover. Smoke tunneling, rapid air movement. You can learn a lot from the front door. If you force the front door and fresh air is pulling past you at about 12 to 15 miles an hour, you have a ventilation limited fire. That is not the one where you want to be getting ahead of the hose line. That's the one you want to control the front door on. The reason that air is moving so fast is because that fire is so starved for oxygen. Don't give it to it until you're ready to go with the hose line. The other thing you want to read from the front door, where's the smoke go? In this case, you get fresh air that tunnels in about the bottom third of the doorway. We call that the neutral plane as it cuts across the doorway. That is a really good sign that the fire is on the same level that you're on. You force that front door and you get smoke out top to bottom and the smoke doesn't tunnel in through the bottom, fire's probably below you. You've got a basement fire. You force that front door open, you get lazy smoke and the smoke starts to move towards the top of the door. The neutral plane is above the front door. You got a fire on the second floor. There's a lot you can learn by watching what the smoke is doing at that front door. And it's not magic. It's not something I made up. It's the pressure exchange that's happening at the front door because of the high pressure and the low pressure. Coordination. I'm not going to harp on this anymore. The important piece here is in our experiments in the one and two story house, with everything closed up, you were looking at 80 seconds in the one story and 160 seconds in the two story before things started to get really bad. If there's already a vent open and you pull up and you got fire showing out of a window, every subsequent vent that you make is going to respond that much faster. So your 80 second coordination window might be 30 seconds. So that's kind of your best case scenario with everything closed up. Chances are it's going to be a smaller window than that. VES, or as people bash me for, VEIS. Apparently, putting an I in there ruined the fire service. <laughs> um, my argument would be, well, let's take the E out, because everybody knows if you vent, in order to search, you have to enter. I don't think everybody's teaching that you need to isolate that door. And I think putting the emphasis on that isolation is extremely important. Because if you don't isolate that door, you put yourself in the flow path. The problem is you put yourself in the opposite end of the flow path. So now you're, even if you're a level above like we show in this scenario, you're trying to crawl down the chimney. And I think we've got the video here that we showed this morning. How many people have a BES? How many people have a VES SOP? A lot of you should. There should be more hands. Because there's going to be the scenario where you show up and there's a credible rescue that needs to be made. There is a person right there in that window and your people need to know how to do that. They need to know 
And one of the things that I see taught all the time that scares the heck out of me, people teach throwing the tip of the ladder through the window. And the problem I have with that is the moment the tip of that ladder goes through that window, the clock started. And that clock is how long you have to get that door shut before you made that room untenable for the person that's in there and any firefighter that's trying to enter into that window. If you don't have all your gear on, breathing air, ready to go through that window when you take it, you're not maximizing the amount of time you have to get that door shut. Look at the flow coming out of that window. If you're going in against that to get that door shut, you don't want to be giving up 30 seconds or a minute of your available time because you threw the ladder through the window and then you got to put your mask on and then you got to put your gloves on and then you got to find your tool and then you got to go up the ladder and then you got to clear it out and then you got to get in and then you got to find the door. That takes a lot of time and those of you that have practiced it know it takes a lot of time. You don't have a lot of time so you need to maximize the time you have to get that door shut. This just shows the impact of closing that door. And you can see here that in the open bedroom, we take the ceiling temperatures from 450 to 150 immediately after shutting that door. The flow goes from 12 miles an hour to nothing. Dan talked earlier about convective flow. That 170 at the floor with a 12 mile an hour wind feels a hell of a lot worse than 170. But with zero miles an hour and 120, you're now talking something that you can operate in. Best chance of victim survival and firefighter survival is behind a closed door. You could have, and Dan and I have seen this on many experiments, you could have the entire front half of a structure absolutely blowing fire. And if somebody's behind a closed door, let's say on the, the CD corner, there's a chance that there's a savable life inside that room. They put a closed door between them and the fire. Same thing happens if everything goes to crap on you guys and you find yourself having to bail out. One of the best things you can do to buy yourself time is to get a closed door between you and where the fire is. Takes you out of the flow path, allows the room that you're in to actually ventilate and allow the smoke to lift. And if you get to a window, you actually have time until that door burns through to have someone get a ladder to you and allow you to go out uh, through that window. We've got a number of cases where firefighters have uh, bailed out through windows on upper floors and the thought of closing a door wasn't in their head. They're thinking this is so bad, I gotta get out that window. And I've never been in that situation, but I can imagine the last thing you're thinking of, unless you train on it, is getting a door shut. There's been cases where firefighters have waited for their comrades to jump out of the window while they sat there and cooked with the door eight feet from them and the thought process was not there to get that door shut to buy them a little bit of time. Vertical ventilation. Uh, we actually wrapped this, wrapped this series of experiments up. Uh, the online training program is finished and we're gonna release it next week. So keep an eye out on our website. There's going to be a new online training program that addresses the vertical ventilation stuff. And for anybody that thought, well, UL is going to tell us not to vertically vent anymore. UL is going to tell us that it's useless. No. That's not what we're telling you. What we're telling you is if you choose to vertically ventilate, here's what's going to happen. If you choose to do it this way, this is what you might see. Here's the timeline of which things happen. In this video, what we're showing is the impact of different hole sizes. And this is going to be pretty much the, the learnings out of this are no different than horizontal ventilation. I don't care how big of a hole you make, there's so much fuel and it's so fuel rich, all you're going to do is make the fire bigger. Unless you apply water or unless you control the air. So in the one on the left, we open a four by four hole or 16 square feet. The one on the right, we open a four by eight hole or 32 square feet. What you're gonna see is air comes in low. In one scenario, we get flames 15, 20 feet out of the roof. In the other scenario, we get 15, 20 foot flames out of the roof and we get fire out the door. The fire is producing more energy than you can let out. Even with a door, 
and a large vertical vent. However, if you put water on the fire, a large vertical vent over the seat of the fire is the best low pressure you can create, and it allows hot stuff out quickly, allows everything else on the fire ground to be performed quickly. So if you understand what you're doing with your vertical vent, it can be a good tool. If you're just doing it because that's what you've always done, or we've always sent to the truck to the roof, or we always cut a hole no matter what, you're missing the boat. You're not doing it right, and we want to be doing it right. So we get the fire burning to the front door. We've got the houses set up so that I've got pre-cut holes into the roof. Pay no attention to the guy falling on the ground. The cable got caught on the pulley, so he had to uh, get the hole open. We also have a section of ceiling that's tied to a forklift. After we go ahead and pull the flap, simulating the hole being cut and pulled, we pull the forklift out of the way and it pulls the ceiling out of the way, simulating a truck crew pushing down the ceiling on the inside. So we have a content fire here, not a structure fire. Ultimately, once you vent it through the attic, you create a structure fire. That's where the quick suppression becomes important. But really, what I want you to see is you don't get a lift. The fire doesn't pull up off the ground. It's a ventilation-limited fire that's looking for oxygen, and you're giving it more. You got 32 square feet of fire coming out of that roof, and you still got fire and smoke coming out of the front door. A whole lot of a little bit of water there is going to do a great amount of good, but ventilation alone, they can't just expand that hole in the roof, and all of a sudden the conditions in the back bedrooms are going to get better. The back bedroom temperatures got much worse in both of those scenarios because we were increasing the burning. We did it on Governor's Island as well. We've got our townhouse. We've got a fire on the first floor. We're going to open up a 4x4 four four hole above the stairwell on the second floor. Watch the top right view in the living room once we open up the roof. So you got a fire that's pulling air through the front door back to the living room fire. Roof just got vented. Watch what's going to happen to that fire. <coughs> it got bigger. The only place that vertical vent improved conditions in that structure was in like the first four feet inside the front door. Everything beyond that got hotter, burning increased, temperatures everywhere went higher. But you throw some water in through that front door, things get better. Operational time frame. Now we're going to start talking about some collapse and some basement stuff. We've run 20 plus tests looking at floor collapses, all different kinds. Dimensional lumber, engineered eye joist, eye joist with cutouts, hybrid trusses, steel seat joists, metal plate connected wood trusses, old houses, new houses, you name it. All of those dots right there are the, are the shortest time to collapse, the longest time to collapse, and we've got your operational timeline layered over top of that. So with the exception of very few cases, all of those floors were collapsing mostly within the first 10 to 12 minutes of operations. So if collapse is not in your mind, when you're thinking operations in any structure, it should be, especially with engineered floor systems. Thermal imaging cameras, not an x-ray device. They're a surface temperature reading device. If you get onto the first floor and you think you're going to see that you have a fire below you simply by scanning the floor, unless there's a penetration between the basement and the first floor that hot gases are flowing through, like gaps in the baseboards or HVAC vents that burn through, your thermal imaging camera is going to tell you that it's 73 degrees on top of the carpet even though it's 1,300 plus degrees in the basement. Wood, carpet, hardwood, tile, all these things are very good insulators. They're very good at hiding heat signature. They're going to hide the signature from your thermal imaging camera. Here's an example that shows you there's a fire underneath this floor. This is just a training exercise that got set up. He's going to go ahead and make a hole and now you can see that there's high temperatures below that floor. You couldn't see it until he made that hole. 
And I'm not advocating that you take a pickhead ax and make a hole in front of you on every fire. Chances are you're not going to make it through the one inch of hardwood and the half inch OSB and everything else. However, you could see that you couldn't tell there was a fire there until the hot gases could travel through and then you could see that there was a fire there. Size up is, we can't emphasize size up enough. First place to collapse was where it was getting the most ventilation. You would see that with a size up, understand what level the fire's on. We've got too many line of duty deaths where they didn't complete the 360, they didn't know what level the fire was on, and that changed the outcome. <coughs> ventilation and flow pass. If you're not gonna die by falling through the floor, the next chance of dying is being in the flow path between the base, fire in the basement and the first floor. How many people have made it down the stairs into a basement fire and put a basement fire out? I would hope a lot of hands go up, right? We've been very successful doing that. But do you know why? Either the fire was small, it ran out of air so it wasn't that big, the basement wasn't ventilated, so it was kind of like holding your thumb on the end of the straw and didn't allow the flow to come up past you because there was no air low. These are important things. You might be a piece of glass or one door being forced away from being caught in a flow path between the basement and the first floor. We had a couple of brothers, Cherry Road in Washington, D.C., a couple of brothers, San Francisco, Diamond Heights Fire, where they never opened up their hose lines. They got caught in the flow path above the fire or between where the fire was and where the fire wanted to go and got dropped and didn't get back up because a vent occurred on the floor below them while they were trying to find the basement stairs and make it down the basement stairs and this is what the temperatures did. They went, in this scenario, they're going from about 250 to 1400 just by making some vents in the basement. And I think the common conception is, well, I'm going to let the hot stuff out of the basement. And if I let the hot stuff out of the basement, things are going to get better on the first floor. The opposite happens. Those basement stairs are the low pressure. That is the chimney. That's where the flow wants to go first. It doesn't want to go outside. It wants to go up and out through the front door. So if you give it that path, that's its primary path. You can't make enough openings in the basement to localize the fire in the basement. It wants to go up the interior paths. That's extremely important. You never want to have crews trying to make those basement stairs and make basement vents on them if the fire responds to the air and that's not well coordinated, they're probably not going to make it. As the basement cut Skip that one. Here's an example. Fire in the basement. Flow path to the front door. And you all know how hard it can be to find basement stairwells in zero visibility with renovated houses. It's hard to coordinate those things. Just the hot gases following the flow path going to the low pressure. You saw it's venting out of the basement. That's not enough. It's not going to localize the fire. It takes over, goes up the stairs, up the first floor, up through the vents, and flashes over the first floor. Here's the two fires I talked about, one in 1999 and one in 2011. I'm not going to go into details, but there's been reports on both of them, and I suggest that you, uh, that you have a look at both those incidents. Well, let's talk about protecting the stairs. We're going to go ahead and we're going to flow 180 gallons a minute out of a 15 16 inch smooth bore at the top of the stairs. It's ideal. We're putting all 180 gallons into that stairwell. We are showering and creating a giant water curtain going down the stairs of this townhouse. You can see we're not having much impact on the basement fire that's ventilation limited and below there. We certainly didn't lift the smoke on the first floor. We're making a whole lot of steam. And I've had uh, a few fire chiefs say this, and it's resonated with me pretty well. If you're not putting the fire out, you're not winning. So if that fire is burning unchecked in that basement, no matter what else you're doing in that structure, 
The structure's weakening. Even if the fire's not coming up the stairs, the fire's finding somewhere else to go. It's finding a low pressure into a wall, into a wall cavity, into a vent. It's going somewhere. You could sit there all day and one of two things is going to happen. You're going to get cooked and steamed or you're going to fall through the floor. So what's that look like? Well, you cool the temperatures at the top of the stairs from 600 to 400 and it's really about the victims, right? Or it's about the firefighters that you're protecting up the stairs. It went from 225 to 210 on the second floor. Is anybody going to notice a difference between 225 and 210 at the... No. And the important piece was to watch your back. In all these scenarios, the kitchen collapsed behind where the simulated hose crew would have been because the fire got up into the pipe chases, got up into the cabinets, ate away at the floor, caused a flashover in the kitchen, and collapsed the kitchen into the basement. Here's what that looks like. That's where the kitchen was. That's where the hose line had to go. So you actually have a low pressure behind you. If you're operating above a basement fire and you think the only place the fire is going to extend and harm the search crew is up through the basement stairs, I think you're fooling yourself. There's a, any more, there's a number of avenues that that fire can take it could come up through a heat register underneath a sofa and flash a sofa over in a room that you can't see that's not right at the top of the stairs. And if you've got limited visibility because there is no neutral plane on the floor you're on, you probably have smoke to the floor, you may not see those things until it's too late. So if all your focus is on that doorway, you can get yourself into trouble, especially the longer you're there. If you're using floor sag as a collapse indicator, if the floor is sagging, clearly the structural stability of that floor is compromised. And what we saw was you may only have 5 to 10 inches of sag on a 20-foot span before the floor completely lets go. The problem is you only have a wingspan of about 3 feet when you're searching. So are you going to feel a difference of 2 to 3 inches between your right hand and your left hand? Maybe, maybe not. As you're working your way around furniture and things like that, you may not notice the sag before the floor completely lets go. So if you're using that as your barometer as to when it's time to get out, probably not a good, it's something to pay attention to, but it shouldn't be your sign that it's time to go. So what happens if we put water in the basement window? This is about the time that I had 10 FDNY chiefs crowded around me watching that thermal imaging view, waiting for a giant burst of heat and fire to come up those basement stairs. Because that's what we think, right? We think we're going to push the fire into the structure and up the stairs. So in this scenario, they, they flowed longer, water longer than they probably needed to, but you can see that there's no giant heat push up through that interior stairwell. There wasn't a huge increase in flow coming out through the front door. And I think the reason for that is what we see in the temperatures. We always teach that water expands 1,700 to 1 and creates a lot of steam. The piece that we don't focus on too much is how much the gases contract <coughs> When you take them from 1,700 to 300, 800 to 300, 1,200 to 400, that many hundred degrees of temperature drop will contract the gases. So you don't get a giant burst of steam and heat and smoke up to the second floor. And even if you did get some steam going up to the second floor, the temperatures on, look at the top of the stairs, 600 degrees to 200 degrees. So you're seeing a dramatic decrease in temperature. The bedroom on the second floor, remember before it went from 225 to 210? It went from 225 to 190. Now because you have the upper hand, you can now vent that second floor and not have to worry about making it a low pressure and being in the chimney because you now have the upper hand. You can vent the heck out of that place because you have the upper hand. You're letting more out than that fire can create. 
So more operations can happen simultaneously because you have the upper hand. And another important piece of that is you flow water at that window and you're flowing water at that window to knock the fire down, not to put it out. You got to get inside and finish it off. If you flow water for 15 seconds and you knock all the gases down and the fire goes back to the contents and you just sit there and think you're done, the fire will come back because you're not putting water everywhere. Stuff is still burning. So if you don't get inside and finish it off, it's going to come back. We did the same thing on the first floor. Fire in the kitchen. What would happen if before, as the truck crew was forcing entry into that front door, the engine crew gave the kitchen a shot for 20 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds off the ceiling before they went inside? Well, the traditional thought is, I'm going to push all the heat and hot gases into the structure downstream. And you've got to remember, there's not a low pressure back there. So there is no flow path that those hot gases can go to. The low pressure is the kitchen window, which is why the fire's coming out that window in the first place. Here's what the temperatures look like. The kitchen dropped by 1,200 degrees. The middle room, which was also on fire, that's where the fire started, went from 600 to 300. And the rear room that had no fire in it went from 500 to 300. There wasn't a push, and that's 14 seconds of water. We're looking at those temperatures immediately at the end of that 14 seconds. Did we see a burst of heat go downstream? And we didn't see it. What if you softened the target on the second floor? What if you went ahead and hit it on the second floor before you went through the front door? Well, three feet off the floor in the hallway using 25 gallons of water at a flashed over bedroom. Fire coming out of the bedroom, hallway door open from that bedroom. What if a victim was laying on the floor outside that bedroom? Well, that's what we looked at. 10 seconds of water, 25 gallons of water. Tight stream off the ceiling immediately where the water is needed, right in the compartment that's on fire. The fire doesn't know whether the water is coming from the interior door or coming from the interior, exterior window. If it hits the ceiling and puts out the gases of what's flashed over, the low pressure can remain the low pressure. The window can still be the low pressure. Hallway temperatures drop from 273 to 104 in 10 seconds. If you did that and immediately followed it up by going inside and you trained on it and you could do it quickly, is that delaying the safety of the occupants inside the house? Something to think about. Four points to consider, just like any tactic. There is a right way and a wrong way to apply water from the outside depending on what you want to do. If you're going to open up a fog stream at a window that is a low pressure, the reason the fire is coming out is because that's the low pressure. If you open up a fog stream and you entrain a whole bunch of air with that water, heat and steam is going to move into the structure because you took away where it wanted to go. It's got to go somewhere, so it's going to mix in that room. If there is a vent open downstream, it is going to mix and it is going to move towards the vent that's downstream. If you keep a tight pattern with a straight stream or a smooth bore and you don't whip it around in a circle, because if you whip it around in a circle, you might as well have a fog nozzle, the water breaks up and it looks just like a fog pattern. If you put it tight off the ceiling, knock the gases down, that window can still act as a vent because you're not sealing it off. That way, the hot gases can continue to come out the way they're going in. We do this on interior attack all the time. We have our O patterns and our clockwise and our counterclockwise and our T's and our inverted Z's and our upside down Australia pattern and stuff like that. <laughs> what are we doing when we do that? Well, if you have a vent opposite the hose line, you actually move the steam ahead of yourself. You create a high pressure where you are and you push the steam to the low pressure. What happens if you don't have a vent opposite the hose line? Where's the low pressure? Behind you, right? 
So as you do this, that steam comes back over top of your head and goes back out the low pressure that you created. If you keep a tight pattern and move it ahead of yourself, you're creating less steam, less chance that the steam's coming back over top of you. You're not as efficiently putting fire out because you're not putting water in as many places, but it's all about understanding whether or not you have a vent opposite you or you don't might change how you use your stream. It's not as simple as, I'm a fireman, I have water, I'm going to wet the crap out of everything. There's actually a reason that things happen on the fire ground. And if you can coordinate the vent opposite you, imagine I said coordinate there, like it's being made when you're ready for it to be made because it will make the fire bigger if you don't coordinate it. That doesn't mean the truck guy should screw the engine, I'm going to the back, I'm venting opposite the hose line. Well, if there's a two minute gap there, he may light up several rooms opposite of where the fire actually was. But if it's coordinated, the vent gets made, the engine crew moves in, and the steam all moves ahead of them, everybody's high-fiving each other afterwards because it worked the way it was supposed to. Same thing with exterior streams. If you cap the exit vent, steam will move inside the structure because that's where you're forcing it to go. It's important that you understand that. The other thing was changing the flow path with air. We had a number of people that said, well, the line was moving through the front, I went into the back, I VES the back, and all of a sudden fire was coming over my head. It had to be because the line pushed the, pushed the fire over me. Well, if you're in the flow path between where the fire is and where the fire wants to go, you shouldn't be surprised that you now have fire coming over your head. It goes both ways. If you come in and you make a vent point, hot gases are coming out over top of you. And if the hose crew does this as they move in, you're going to get steam that's going to move over the top of you because you're now in the exit point. So it's understanding the difference between how to make steam do what you want it to do and how to make it not do what you want it to do based on the scenario. And it's not simple as always do it this way. It depends on the timing and who's where. I'm going to pass it over to Dan for some townhouse fires.